Welcome back to the podcast history of our world. Chapter 3, Legacy of Prometheus. One million years ago, our ancestor, Homo erectus, was poised to conquer the world. No other hominid has come close to their level of evolutionary sophistication. Strong arm muscles for hurling rocks, hands capable of wielding deadly stone knives, were gentle enough to hold a baby. Femur bones designed to withstand long-distance running, a thick skull to protect a large brain, and tough jaw muscles to support an omnivorous diet. Erectus had advanced the stone tool-making techniques of Homo habilis and may have even used wooden spears. There's even the possibility of a rudimentary hunter-gatherer society here, which leaves open additional possibilities of organized attacks against competitors. Yes, Homo erectus was at the top of their game when the species began to migrate out of Africa. But in order to make it in the cold and unknown land beyond, Homo erectus would need more than rocks and brains. Neither one will keep you warm in the winter, and body hair is so 1.5 million years ago. What they needed was a miracle. What they got was inspiration in a flash. It's nighttime on the veldt. The air is eerily still, and there's that distinctive ozone smell wafting about. Off in the distance are bursts of light, followed by a faint rumbling. The duration between the lights and the booms are growing shorter and shorter, though, and what was once a brief image are white streaks slicing through the dark sky until kapow! A tree is struck down and erupts in a terrifying display of sparks, illuminated in a brief white glow that quickly subsides to reveal a roaring fire. Just about every animal on Earth has a natural instinctive aversion to fire. A deer doesn't have to burn itself to know fire hurts, it just does. Your dog knows to keep its distance from the charcoal grill you've got going on outside. Unless you're my dog. As she routinely concludes, the dangers pale in comparison for the opportunity of free barbecue. Well, my dog aside, humans are a different story. Mankind has always been strangely attracted to fire ever since that first brave or deranged Homo erectus picked up a burning branch, felt the heat radiate off it, got lost in the hypnotic dance of the flames, and thought, hey, I'm going to use this. This is, without hyperbole, a watershed moment for our species. In addition to providing the basic warmth and light, fire keeps away predators, and the smoke drives off mosquitoes and other bugs. Fire is used in early toolmaking to harden spear ends for a sharper point, and fire even promotes language and reinforces social bonds. After a big meal, just imagine the gathering that took place around a hearth or campfire, where stories of the day's hunt could be told, or news could be spread. Or maybe it was like that campfire scene in Blazing Saddles, and this is where we can pinpoint humanity's enduring love of puerile humor. <laughs> oh, that is a funny part. Ah, but most important amongst all its uses is that fire cooks food. Cooking is defined as the act of applying heat to ingredients for sustenance. Raw meat can be made more digestible and kills whatever nasty bacteria might be on it, and cooking renders previously inedible plants okay for eating. Two veggies come to mind, cassava, native to South America, and yams, native to Africa. Both need to be cooked, cassava to destroy toxins, and yams to make them soft. Have you ever tried eating a raw potato? Exactly. And through experimentation and perseverance, humanity learned that throwing slabs of meat on a fire not only smelled good, but it tasted good too. Cooking meant pre-digesting food now, and since the body doesn't need to work as hard, things began to change, physically. Our already shrinking incisors were joined by the rest of our teeth and jaws. Additionally, our digestive tract shortens, and this savings in caloric energy is redirected to where it's more needed, the development of the brain. Think about a cow and its four stomachs. That's a lot of mass and energy devoted to digesting grass, and not so much towards intelligence. Oh, you'd be hard-pressed to find a more blissful animal on this earth, but can a cow complete complex tasks like a crow or octopus? No, they can't. There may be a Zen philosophy point I'm missing here, but whatever. Back to fire. 
The estimate on when it was first harnessed is between 1.7 million years ago and as late as 400,000 years ago, followed by cooking food between 1.5 million years ago and 250,000 years ago. The reason for such a giant gap in time comes from a dearth of early evidence. The Jokodian Caves in China, where the famous Peking Man was found, has these thick layers of ash dating from 700,000 years ago, but while it's definitive evidence of fire usage, the jury's out for cooking. Compare that with evidence of cooking in the form of charred bones, dating back 350,000 years at a place in Hungary called Vertasolush, which is my best go at the pronunciation of it. Now, no other species on this earth has ever been observed cooking food. So the next time you're at the park grilling up burgers or roasting some kind of vegetable or even deep frying some sliced dill pickles, oh man, so good. Consider that what you are doing is at the very core of what it means to be human. Chew on that. Well, Homo erectus may have learned to harness fire, but they sure don't know how to create it yet and probably never will. At this point, a fire was probably kept alive in a hearth by adding kindling and transported using branches. Despite never creating it, Homo erectus controls fire well enough to spread out of Africa to populate Europe, Asia, and Indonesia, where Java Man, the first Homo erectus fossils, were found. Now, anthropology business is tricky business. Commonly held assumptions can be quickly discredited based on new findings, and then there's always some delay updating journals and textbooks. Things that Homo erectus used to be credited with, such as religion, may not be theirs at all. And rather than explore all the ifs and buts of this, I'm just going to fast forward a bit to about 400,000 years ago in Europe. More compact and robust than Homo erectus, with a bigger head and a bigger brain? Well, here comes Homo neanderthalensis, the Neanderthals. Named after the Neander Valley in Germany, where the first fossils were found, the name of both the valley and the species translates to New Man. Kind of auspicious, huh? Now, if you want to sound proper, the correct pronunciation is Neanderthal, but I think most of us are accustomed to saying Neanderthal, so let's go with that. The Eurasian range of Neanderthals extended from the Iberian Peninsula in the west of Europe to roughly Turkmenistan in the east. No Neanderthal bones have ever been found in Africa, the Americas, East and South Asia, and Oceania. When the average person hears the word Neanderthal, a picture of an almost cartoonish caveman springs to mind. I mean, the name itself is considered an insult. You know, they've got the leopard print tunic, the giant wooden club, that sloping brow, and probably go around shouting Captain Caveman. Well, maybe not that last part, but dear listeners, this is an antiquated view, completely without merit. It's time for our departed friends to receive some much-needed PR. For starters, they're only part-time cave dwellers. Spring and summer meant campsites on beaches or pastures. The only reason why everyone associates them with caves is because that's where most of the fossils come from. Outdoor habitats tend to not preserve as well because they're exposed to the elements. Erosion, floods, that sort of thing. But caves offer excellent protection, and from those sites we've learned Neanderthals knew how to create fire using flint, how to craft stone axes and flint knives through napping techniques, and crafting wooden spears. They're even believed to have developed a language, despite that the shape of their skull and larynx would limit their communication, and, contradicting the typical caveman image again, gives their voices a higher pitch than ours. Neanderthal man was also deeply social and close to their families, operating in groups of 15 or so and devoting care towards the sick and elderly. How can we surmise this fact? At the Shanidar fossil site in Iraq, the skeleton of a 40-year-old man from 80,000 to 60,000 BC was found having sustained extreme wounds. An eye socket had been broken and healed over, indicating a head wound that resulted in losing an eye. His right shoulder had atrophied as a result of an arm amputation. He had broken a foot at one point and showed signs of arthritis in his ankles and knees. He must have been in considerable pain, and to survive would need extensive care and attention. Yet his bones say he died at 40 to 45 years old, which would make him pretty old for a Neanderthal. If the average life expectancy was about 30, then the only conclusion is that his family, or clan, or whatever social unit took care of him. Shanidar Cave is also notable for how the Neanderthal skeletons were found, in graves. 
Burial of the dead is a rare thing in nature. There are many animals which grieve when one of their own dies, for example, chimpanzees, dogs, and most notably elephants, which actually cry. Some appear to have a kind of funerary process, too. Magpies have been seen spreading grass on the deceased, and elephants will stand guard over their fallen, protecting the body from predators, sometimes for days. Yet it appears that mankind is the only one that engages in placing the dead into the ground. Neanderthal graves at Shanidar Cave are like this, although one stands out above the rest. A man in his late 30s to early 40s was buried here, and curiously, soil tests from his grave showed large concentrations of ancient pollens. It's a sign that flowers were laid there. What a simple but profound gesture that speaks volumes about their emotional intelligence. Well, as so often happens, evidence begets new questions. Since Neanderthals buried their dead, does this mean they believed in an afterlife? Or a religion? Hmm... Possibly? Neanderthal man had a frontal lobe large enough for abstract thought, and probably had some spiritual beliefs based on their experiences with the world. One theory as to this Neanderthal religion is the cult of the cave bear. There are no more cave bears, the species died out around 27,000 BC in Europe. And as its name implies, they spent a lot of time in caves, and not just for hibernation. Neanderthals also spent time in caves and would have had frequent contact with them. As such, a kind of respect was developed based on two aspects. On one hand, a dead cave bear could provide a great amount of meat, and its thick fur would be invaluable when the weather turned cold. Not to mention that during the winter, stumbling across a hibernating cave bear's den meant a veritable feast in those dark and lean times. Yet respect also came from the fact that the cave bear is over half a ton of pure muscle, giant teeth, and claws, making it an extremely dangerous foe. All this may have elevated the cave bear in the mind of the Neanderthals to an almost supernatural status. For instance, at the Regodou Cave in France, a Neanderthal hunter was buried with the bones of a cave bear. It could be a trophy, perhaps, nothing too extraordinary, but further away at Le Fortan Cave, archaeologists discovered seven cave bear skulls arranged in a circle. And at the Drachenloch Caves of Switzerland, which translates to dragon's lair, by the way, so cool, a stone chest in the ground was found to contain the skulls of six cave bears, all facing the same direction. Other so-called bear temples have been discovered around Europe, too. So, what's the verdict? Well, you could read the Clan of the Cave Bear books if you want a little speculative historical fiction, and we could say there is definitely something mystical to this cave bear thing, but honestly, we'll never really know for sure. The Neanderthals have two other rituals that are unusual enough to merit attention. The first involves the use of red ochre, a pigment made from a type of clay or dirt. Around 200,000 years ago, it starts popping up at Neanderthal sites. Graves from places like La Chapelle au Son in France and Kafsa in Israel contain the lumps of red ochre. In Moldova, an oval structure made of mammoth bones was found with red ochre at its center. And at Nar Ibrahim Cave in Lebanon, the full skeleton of a deer appears, carefully buried, but covered in red ochre. Ah, let the theories commence. The other ritual of the Neanderthals, and less endearing than the flower thing, is cannibalism. Though there's debate in the anthropological community over how extensive it was, there's also really good evidence to support this. From the town of Krapina in Croatia, Neanderthal bones were found with cut marks, indicative of someone stripping the meat from them with a tool. Same as in El Cidrone in Spain, and in Lazio, Italy, at the Grotta Guattari, Neanderthal skulls were found with the foramen magnum, that point where the spine connects to the skull, broken open, which means easier access to eating the brains. This was also seen nearby at Monte Cerceo, only this time the skull was found in a ring of stones. Alright, and before we jump to conclusions, while the bones with the grooved cuts in them are pretty obvious evidence of cannibalism, there are opposing theories with the whole brain-eating thing. At the Grotta Guattari, the skulls were found with tooth marks from hyenas on them. Maybe they were eaten? And at Cerceo, well, could it be that the skull was jammed onto a wooden stake to warn enemies away, or maybe invoke some spirit? The wood would have long since rotted away, leaving behind just a skull and lots of confusion. 
All right, moving away from that, let's check out this weird thing happening in the time stream. The year is roughly 200,000 BC, and there are some strange new-looking hominids walking around. They're not as muscular as Neanderthals, nor as fast as Homo erectus. In fact, their heads have this flat forehead and a jutting chin, whereas the Neanderthals have a thick protruding brow and a receding chin. Their skulls are much smaller, yet it's clear that they have amazing intellectual powers. Well, welcome aboard, Homo sapiens. You finally made it to the podcast. Anatomically modern humans, members of Homo sapiens who look like us, enter the scene between 200,000 and 150,000 BC in various parts of Africa, Europe, and the Levant, the stretch of land in the eastern Mediterranean. 150,000 BC is also the date for mitochondrial Eve, that supposed ancestor we all descend from. There's a chromosomal Adam, too, but he doesn't appear until about 60,000 BC. I don't profess to know much about genetic science, so I encourage you to research for yourself on this fascinating and slightly controversial topic. Homo sapiens begin their own slow spread through the world around 100,000 years ago, except possibly for a massive setback that happens between 77 and 69,000 years ago. Off in Sumatra, at Lake Toba, a supervolcano erupted with a violent ferocity unseen in the modern age. Vesuvius is a day in the park compared to this, Krakatoa a light summer breeze. The force of Toba's eruption sends so much ash into the atmosphere that the entire planet is plunged into a 6-10 to ten year period of volcanic winter, a plummeting of temperatures because the sun's rays can't penetrate through the thick clouds of sulfuric acid and soot in the air. Plants will die, lakes will dry up or become toxic, animals will starve and have their numbers reduced by hunters, and Homo sapiens suffers deeply. Some estimates indicate that by the end of this nightmare, our numbers dwindle to between 1,000 to 10,000 breeding pairs. And that's for the entire species. With such a small gene pool, it is a possibility that one of those ancient daddies could be chromosomal Adam, but that's pure theory. No one's even 100% sure that our numbers collapse that much. The only real facts we have are the dates of mankind spreading across the world. The earliest at 100,000 years ago, being West Africa and Southwest Asia, and the most recent being Tierra del Fuego, the tip of South America, in 10,500 BC. Homo sapiens covered a tremendous amount of ground and did it all with the most basic of technology. The very last spot on Earth to be colonized, not counting Antarctica, is Rapa Nui, Easter Island, which has initial settlement dates ranging from 300 to 1200 AD. And that was done, again, using basic technology, a tradition of seafaring, and that brave Polynesian spirit. Going back to a point brought up in the last episode, as our ancestors spread out across the world, natural selection began favoring individuals with certain traits. We've discussed many at length, but then there's the interesting topic of skin pigmentation. Why does human skin come in so many different shades? It's remarkable when you think about it, and if you really want to see how far our skin can go, look up the skin disorder Argyria. Ah, colloidal silver. <laughs> well, anyway, last time I mentioned that as Homo erectus lost its body hair, natural selection favored those with a mutation for darker skin. Those with greater concentrations of melanin, the pigment which is responsible here, were far less susceptible to skin damage caused by UV radiation from the sun. As our ancestors traveled north to places where sunlight is inconsistent all year, to the point of a significant reduction in the winter, for example, another dilemma arose. Well, two actually. First, sunlight triggers a response in the skin to produce vitamin D necessary for organ and bone health by facilitating calcium absorption. Too little of it can cause rickets, skeletal and cardiac problems, and even immune deficiencies. Dark skin reduces the amount of sunlight absorbed, which therefore reduces the amount of vitamin D synthesized, but this problem is mitigated by simply living closer to the tropics where the sun is always on full blast. The second dilemma, and this is more of a modern theory, so I'll explain it a bit more, concerns vitamin B9, also known as folate or folic acid. Folic acid is not produced by the human body. The only way to get it is by ingesting grains, fruits, and vegetables that have it, like spinach, broccoli, turnip greens. Actually, the name folic comes from the Latin folium, 
meaning leaf, and you can see why. Although pound for pound, beans are the best source of folates. The vitamin is essential to the health of our cells and DNA, although its role in pregnancy is probably the most prominent. Back in the 90s, studies directly linked adequate folate consumption to preventing congenital neural tube disorders. At the earliest weeks of a fetus's development, before there's a proper central nervous system, there's a rudimentary version called a neural tube. Alright, best way to do this without an illustration. Picture a paper plate. Because this starts as a neural plate, actually. Now imagine you're folding it into an M, but also connect the two top points of that M so it looks like there's an O in the middle. What you've got there is the beginning of the spinal cord. During this folding process, if an opening or hole occurs, or there's an incomplete fusing, a fetus can develop one of these neural tube disorders, like spina bifida or anencephaly. Folic acid deficiency was directly linked to this, so governments around the world started enriching basic foodstuffs like bread with vitamin B9. Pregnant and expecting women were also encouraged to take folic acid supplements as well. So far, the only concern with overconsumption of this is that it can mask symptoms of vitamin B12 deficiency in people 65 or older, which can cause nerve damage. Although just recently, in February of 2015, Portuguese researchers at the University of Porto found that rats given 20 times the recommended dosage had offspring that grew up to be obese and diabetic. But then again, the rats given the recommended dosage had far healthier offspring. So now you know, but where the heck am I going with this? Well, stay with me here, because while UV rays trigger vitamin D production, they also destroy folate traveling through blood vessels. You see, now it comes together. So we have a biological problem here. The very earliest dark-skinned ancestors in northern Europe and Eurasia are protected against folate destruction and skin cancer, but they're not getting nearly enough vitamin D. So how to balance the whole thing out? The solution? Natural selection favors those with a new specific mutation. Remember that mutation isn't always a bad thing. I mean, sure, Rogue has it rough with hers, but Wolverine's healing factor is pretty handy. But in this case, the mutants are those members of Homo erectus, Neanderthalensis, and Sapiens with moderate to low levels of melanin in their skin. Depigmented skin allows more sunlight to be absorbed during times when less sunlight reaches the Earth. So the vitamin D thing is resolved. But well, then there's still that whole problem with folate and skin cancer. Well, I think you do know how the body copes with that. Tanning. The skin is physically changing to protect against too much UV radiation, and in a time before sunscreen, that's well, the best the human body can do. Well, there we are, the best theory so far as to the differences regarding human pigmentation. Some would argue that because our closest living genetic relatives, the chimpanzee, have pale skin covered in black hair, that this would also be the default color for our species. I can see why they'd reach that conclusion. I mean, they're completely wrong and asinine, but I can at least see why. These people fail to remember that our common ancestor, the one all modern humans descended from, did not have body hair. The development of darker skin means we don't need it. And I've already mentioned all the reasons, so no. They'll have to take their weird social theories elsewhere. Moving right along. Homo sapiens has spread across the world, but it's weird to keep calling them us by a scientific label. For all intents and purposes, they are people. Primitive for sure, but fully recognizable people. A term many listeners may be familiar with is that of Cro-Magnon Man, so named after the region in France where the skeletons were found. Cro-Magnon Man is an anatomically modern human, but the name stuck around for a while because Western society dominated the research scene. Oh sure, you might have found an AMH skeleton in China, but we're going to call it Cro-Magnon Man anyway because we call dibs. Bottom line? Cro-Magnon only applies to anatomically modern human skeletons found in that region. Everything else, we'll call AMH for short. Not as catchy and easy to roll off the tongue, but you gotta admit, it makes more sense. And before we conclude this chapter, and since we're on the topic of history terminology, what about other terms that are apparently not only incorrect, but insensitive and possibly offensive too? Like how using hunter-gatherer demeans women as the subordinate gatherer of food, while assuming a patriarchy existed right from the start. Or that using BC and AD for dates is an overt insult to anyone not Christian. Well folks, I'm taking a stand. 
Fortunately for this podcast, hunter-gatherers don't really play a large role, but I do believe it is simply a catch-all term to describe pre-agrarian tribal societies, not one that insinuates enforced gender roles. And as for the BCAD argument, well, as a history teacher, I know the textbooks have switched over to BCE and CE, meaning before the Common Era and the Common Era. I can also definitely see a future where that is the de facto system, and no one remembers the old ways except a few grumpy historians. But you do know this system is still based entirely on the presumed birth year of Jesus Christ. Are we hoping that no one will notice this? Or that people will be less offended just by using a different acronym? I mean, keep in mind, I've met folks, and I'm sure you have too, who still think AD stands for after the death of Jesus, so yeah. Personally, I don't care what dating system we all agree on, but I'm using BC and AD in this podcast because aside from a familiarity with it, I just can't give in to this self-satisfying sensitivity. I'm not looking at this from a religious or societal bias, just an aversion to looking for problems where there were none. If everyone out there really cared about people's sensitivities, then in my opinion, we should ditch the current dating system altogether. All of it. We finally live in a world where everybody has been connected. So let's start over. I propose one of two ideas for a new dating system for where to put the year one. Hear me out on this. Either 1945, which was when the United Nations was officially founded, or if you're not too keen on that, 1983, the year when the internet was first activated. What better way to honor that which brought us closer than ever before than the internet? 1983 could mark year one of a glorious new age where humanity is not defined or classified by religious, societal, or political divisions. And it's also the year I was born, so I could feel really smug about the whole thing. Oh yeah, I'm totally in favor of 1983 as year one. Someone get a petition going here, and while you do that, I'll get back to the history. Well, next time, we continue on with mankind's earliest days, including what becomes of the Neanderthals. We'll also take a deeper look at humanity's earliest achievements. When you're starting from scratch, inventions seem to flow from basic questions, like, how can I kill and eat that animal all the way over there if I'm all the way over here? That's a valid point. And if there's one word to summarize the coming time period, it's ingenuity. Lots of clever things happening, including the first interspecies alliance and the first attempts towards creative expression. Oh yes, because at some point in what would become Spain, a nameless person would descend into a dark cave, only torchlight to guide their steps. And there on that cave wall, they discovered the joy of painting on the podcast history of our world. 